Make it easy on your sound tech. That's pretty much what the theme of this video is. Great drums start at the source, but even more than that, they start with the player. So today I've got with me Travis Dammy, who's a great sound tech and a great drummer. He's played with a bunch of different worship leaders, and I'm asking him to tell you guys what it looks like for a great drummer to prepare to have the best worship set of their life, or at least of that week. So what made you want to get into worship drumming specifically, or why, what are you doing now that you're, you're mostly doing worship drums? I know you did uh, like drum line in college. I know you've got a lot of other skills, but what made you want to hone in on worship drumming? I started doing worship drumming because that's what my dad did. I started playing in a youth group, I think at age 14. And so that was just a logical starting place. I did concert band in middle school, concert band, marching band through high school, and then in college. And when I was in college, I was studying broadcast journalism and I was doing marching band, which was probably one of the best times of my life. It was pushing me harder than I've ever been pushed skill-wise. And there was just the stress of first time college student and living on my own. So that was a memorable time as far as drumming goes. But I was also helping out at campus ministry on a Thursday night and playing at church on Sunday while I was in college. People would ask me as I was studying, they would ask me, what do you want to do with a journalism degree? Do you want to be in front of the camera, behind the camera, radio? What do you want to do? My answer to them would be, I want to play drums. And the reason for that was because when I played specifically in worship, I felt more energized. After I'd play for a football game doing marching band, I was dead, tired, drained completely just from the physical nature of it. There was some fulfillment in it for sure, but it was playing for worship that helped me. Like I felt energized and I wanted to do it more. That me worshiping on my instrument, feeling the Lord, and then watching how it affected other people as they worshiped the Lord, that was what kind of energized me. And that's what I decided, that's what I wanted to do. In the Bible, the idea of a Levite was what kind of popped out to me. Tell the people that are watching on YouTube What's your process look like for getting prepared for a worship set? So before you show up to rehearsal or before you're showing up to sound check, what are you getting prepared mentally and even learning the songs, parts and stuff like that? Walk us through that process for you so you can really nail it when it comes down time, time to it. Yeah, it's, I would say it's evolved over the years. I've been playing drums for a long time. So there's a lot of worship songs that I already know. It depends a little bit on the set list that I get from the worship leader and when I get that set list from the worship leader. If I get it early enough, even if I know the songs, I like to go back and I'll reference the original. So the one that most people are familiar with. And then I'll listen to like some different churches that have put their version on YouTube or whatever. And I'll see how did they interpret it? Did they do the same kind of roller coaster of dynamics? Did the drummer play a different part? And kind of try and decide, did they do it better? Are there aspects of it that they did better that I would want to put into my version of that song? If I don't get the songs early enough, there's a good chance right now where I'm at where I'll already know the songs pretty well or I'll be able to fake them pretty well. Rewind a number of years I would listen to the song. I actually had a system for how I would learn a song. I would listen to it for the first time and just kind of chart out if it was intro, synth, can't worship without a synth. Uh, you have intro, verse, first chorus, and then the drums come in on that, that repeat of the verse. And I would kind of chart out that part of the song, then I would go back. I would listen to what specifically the, the patterns that the drummer was doing. And then maybe third time through, I would listen specifically for fills that I thought were kind of signature fills that make that song specific, as well as try and listen for the other stuff that's happening that the drummer is complimenting so that I make sure I don't miss that stuff. So it would usually take me probably 45 minutes to an hour to learn a song if it was a new song that I hadn't played before. Wow. If I could sum up what you just said, you would basically get the scaffolding of the big picture of the song, right? The framework of the song, and then go on to the parts so that you know what part to be played in which section, you kind know, of the patterns and all that. And then from there, you're trying to figure out the things that pop out in the different sections. So the fills for you, the fills for the other instruments, kind of the signature hooks or whatever 
that you're having for each song. That's how you're going through and charting it out and then getting it written in your mind so that when it comes time to play, you know what you're listening for in your monitor mix and all the different parts of that. There's been a couple of times where I haven't had enough time to fully learn the song and I've only had enough time to learn my parts. And then the worship leader decides to adjust the arrangement accordingly, depending on the leading of how they felt or the Holy Spirit's leading, however you want to interpret it. And because I only learned my parts, they would change things. I wouldn't know, wait, what drum part goes with these lyrics? Because I didn't pay attention to the lyrics. I just right. was like, okay, drums quiet, drums medium, drums loud, drums off, drums medium, drums loud. And when they switched things around, I was like, wait, what am I supposed to be playing right now? So I love how you explained it. Yeah. It can definitely be a challenge keeping up with worship leaders. On a worship team, we're a bunch of artistic people working together. So we have to accommodate for each other's artistic and creative expressions. So it's it's always a dance. You've gotta be prepared to be flexible whenever you're working with creative people. So if you're a tech and you're out there and you're wondering what this is, they're following their feelings and you're just gonna to have to learn to roll with it. If you're a creative person, pay attention to what Travis is saying and recognize that some people's preparation for what they thought you were wanting them to do might not have prepared them for what you're doing now. So you'll have to watch out for that too. So Travis, how early do you arrive and what's your process look like for getting started on like the day of sound check or if you're having a midweek rehearsal, how much earlier than the start time are you planning on getting there and what do you show up with prepared already? Yeah, so my goal is to show up about 15 minutes early. And that, it depends a little bit on how familiar I am with the venue that I'm gonna be at. This is where I play most of the time. So I'm pretty familiar with it. There's not a ton of other drummers that are really moving a ton of things. So I can usually come in and get set up and comfortable fairly quickly. If I'm helping out at another church, I like to show up 15 to 30 minutes early because I don't know what I'm walking into. I don't know if the drums sound good, if I'm gonna to have to tune drums. So uh, 15 minutes is kind of my minimum and I'll bring, I'll almost always bring my own cymbals, my own snare drum, obviously my own sticks and brushes and all the different accoutrements. If they have the option for it, I like to bring my sample pad, my Roland sample pad it helps so much with being able to have those different textures that you can do electronically to give songs a different vibe or to be able to recreate what a lot of worship songs are doing with having kind of loop sounds mm -hmm. with acoustic drums. So that's what I usually bring. And depending on how familiar I am with the, the venue, I'll show up a minimum of 15 minutes early. So when you're getting set up and you're getting your monitor mix dialed in, I know there's a lot of people that are moving over from monitor wedges to in-ears. A lot of people don't know how to mix their own in-ears or they, they get lost mixing them. Uh, either they say, I've got everything turned up too loud and I can't hear anything, or you know something is way too loud and I don't know how, what to do. How do I fix this? What's your approach for mixing monitors yourself, but also guiding a new drummer, you teach drums to, how do you guide them into making their monitor mix work for them instead of working against them? Yeah, so I'll give kind of my general idea and then I'll give something specific for drummers. And this is not what I recommend for other musicians necessarily. When I'm mixing my monitors, I want to have most of the channels centered around half volume. That means that I'm gonna have plenty of room to turn things up if I need to turn things up and plenty of room to turn things down if I need to turn them down. And that's somewhat dependent on the sound engineer, the gain structure they're sending to the personal monitor. And if everything's around halfway, I can usually make things work as long as the sound engineer is doing a decent job of sending balanced gain structure. Now, for me, I'm a drummer, and one of the things as a sound engineer that I have to fight against is when drummers, when their dynamic doesn't match the dynamic of the rest of the band or the singers. So I call it mismatched dynamics. What I do to help with that is I have myself loud enough that if I'm playing too loud, I can't hear the singers. In my mind for worship, the singing vocal is the most important thing for people to hear because that's what helps the congregation sing along. So I'm going to have myself pretty loud in my mix. If I'm bashtastic on the cymbal, and I can't hear the singers, I know, okay, I can't hear the singers, I need to adjust my dynamic to serve the singers. So 
So my recommendation for newer drummers is make yourself really loud and make your cymbals pretty loud in your mix. Because as a sound engineer, uh, usually the first thing the sound engineer gets rid of is the hi-hat. Nobody wants more hi-hat in their mix. And then, I'm so guilty of that. I, I make tutorials and people are like, what about the hi-hat channel? And I'm like, what hi-hat channel? I don't need a hi-hat when the drummers are bashing away at it like they're angry with it. Yeah, so uh, making sure that the drummer has the cymbals loud enough so that when they're hitting hard, the cymbals are abrasive in their ears. So that um, hopefully it'll, it's, it's a little bit of, I don't know, psychoacoustics, I don't know, big words that James uses. <laughs> Monitor where, psychology, yeah, right? <laughs> where I want the drummer to learn how to have a huge kick and snare drum all the time, but be able to use the cymbals more as texture, and the texture creates the dynamic rather than the volume creating the dynamic. And it's way easier to just play, this hand goes the same height as this hand, and that means that the hi-hat is gonna be annoyingly loud in relation to the snare drum. And so what I wanna be able to do is kind of trick myself and those other drummers into playing that hi-hat quieter and just using texture for the dynamic and still hitting that snare drum nice and hard. Because right now, the worship sound, as far as how I'm hearing it, is kick and snare are king. And the cymbals are, they're like a texture. They're like a wash underneath the kick and snare in a mix. So I wanna use my mix to kind of help me facilitate that for the sound engineer. I wanna make their life easy. So how I like to say it is I want them to be able to go on up pretty good. So they don't have to band-aid me right. or like help me with some like crazy surgery on the drums and they can simply kind of craft the edges of it and they can be a little bit more artistic with the drums rather than kind of doing surgery. Yes. I like to avoid drum surgery whenever possible. One of the reasons why I bought Travis on, because whenever I'm mixing and Travis is playing drums, I push up the mics. I do my normal EQ stuff because that's my habit and that's kind of the sound uh, that you have to go for. But it just sounds good right out of the gate. I'm not having to do a ton of compression or parallel this and that. I'm not having to, to do surgery on the EQ. It doesn't look like it's a you know, a chop fest with, you know, tons of frequencies cut and other ones boosted. It all just sounds pretty good straight at the mic. So that's a huge thing. If you're a drummer and you're watching this, make it easy on your sound tech. That's pretty much what the theme of this video is. You brought up a good point and I wanna talk about a little bit more about the dialing back on the cymbals, not just for the overall balance, but what are some other techniques that you use to reduce bleed? Because one thing that I hate having to do is gate toms. And I might do it a little bit, but if there's a ton of in the tom mic and you gate it, and then they hit the tom and that opens up, then you get the with the boom. And I, I hate that. Or you just make the tom so dull that it doesn't have any attack anymore. And then you're just sunk at that point. So how do we get away from that problem so that we're not trying to solve the problem with gates. We're not trying to you know, put contact triggers on the drums to open up our gates. Aside from easing up on the cymbals and making your monitor mix help you balance yourself better, what other things are you doing to reduce drum bleed? There's a lot of different nuance to it. One of the things I'll add to what I said earlier, a smart drummer, that I got to hear, he, I think he did a video or something, Instagram post maybe. He said, drummers should beat their drums and pet their cymbals. And so that's kind of that working on those mismatched dynamics of really hitting the snare drum hard and then being gentle on the ride cymbal, which is a little bit tricky with coordinating our body, but it's something to really work at. The other things that I do, I like to know the polar pattern of the tom mics so that I put the tom mic in a specific place so it's going to reject that ride cymbal as much as possible. Another thing that I changed from when I was playing pet band in high school and college when we didn't have microphones on the drums, you just had to play loud to fill the volleyball or basketball stadium with sound, is when I added mics, I took my ride cymbal from kind of being in this nice, comfortable spot where it was similar to the snare movement, I brought it up higher and I angled it more towards me so that it was farther away from 
the floor tom mic for sure. The floor tom mic, the frequencies of it, you have to hit it pretty hard and solid for it to really speak. And if I have the ride cymbal that speaks really easy right next to it, it makes it so the bleed is pretty tricky to work with. So I raised my ride cymbal so it's farther away from the microphone. I angled it so I'm not like bashing on the edge of it and spending $300 a month replacing my ride cymbal, as well as I want to think about the positioning of the high tom mic and where it's in relation to my cymbals. I'm compromising a little bit because I could set up my drums so they were really comfortable for me to play physically, but they don't sound as good through microphones. And I want to balance that so that what I'm doing, what I'm speaking on the drums is communicated clearly and easily to the end listener, whoever that would be. You can think of it as an audience, the congregation, the other people on stage with me. I want it to be pleasant for them to listen to so they're not like, uh, don't like what I'm hearing. I want them to love what they're hearing. I'm compromising my setup a little bit to facilitate mic'd drums. And one thing Travis mentioned about polar patterns on the microphone, there's basically two types of polar patterns that you'll get on tom mics, and that's cardioid, which basically means point the back of it at what you don't want to pick up. And then there's hypercardioid, which has a little bit narrower pattern in the front, and it will reject more from the sides, but there's a little lobe in the back that will pick up as well. So if you look up, you know, you take a picture of your drum mic and say, what polar pattern is this? You can find out, and then if it's hypercardioid, then you don't want to point the back of that microphone right at the ride cymbal. You might want to have it angled a little bit. Or if you've got a high tom, and you've got cymbals on either side, that might be a great time to have a hypercardioid mic because it's gonna reject more sound coming in from the sides. Big thanks to Travis for coming in and answering Mark questions. If you're a drummer or a sound tech and you wanna learn some more, you can type your questions down in the comments below. If you haven't yet, go ahead and hit subscribe and ding the little bell to get notified every time I'm posting new content. And let me know what videos you'd like to see or if you'd have some more questions for Travis, I'm sure we could bring him back on. Check out some more videos down here and we'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.